All right, uh, our text this morning is uh, Proverbs 27, and we begin this morning in verse 19 and all the way to 27. As looking into water, a face to a face, that's 19, so a man's heart reflects the man. And here's 20, the grave and Abaddon are never satisfied, and the eyes of man are never satisfied. 21, the crucible for silver, the furnace for gold, and a person is tested according to his praise. 23, be sure to know the condition of your flocks. You may have an and there. It's really not, there's not a particle in the inspired language. It's just one simple exhortation. Be sure to know the condition of your flocks. Pay attention to your herds. 24, wealth does not endure forever. And then there is a, a particle here in the inspired language. And so we translate the particle as a oracle, an exhortive oracle. So it reads this way, wealth does not endure forever and certainly not a crown from generation to generation. So it's an emphatic oracle. Uh, 25, if the grass is renewed, then new growth appears and the vegetation of the mountain is harvested. And the young rams will provide your clothing, and the he goats, the price of a field. And you will have enough goat's milk for your food and for the life of your servant girls. Now, look at those last three Proverbs 25, 26, 27. You see the and, 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 those are all connective. So, what you have in 25, 26, and 27 is one proverb, and it's telling us, here's a photograph, now let's look at the photograph this way, now let's look at the photograph that way, now let's look at the photograph this way. It's essentially giving you context and texture to the same photograph. So. It's a proverb that I like to take young men through that are feeling particular pressures about the future, and we'll get into that. Okay, so here we begin our exposition, verse 19. This is a concisely worded proverb, and what makes it difficult is it's called an emblematic proverb. Emblematic because Water here is likened to a mirror that reflects. So it's an image that tells us about the image. That's why it's emblematic. The, the second parallel is line one, the face, versus the heart in line two. So the top line opens as looking into water, the idea is, looking into water as a mirror. Uh, and the proverb here, water is the natural reflector. It shows the face. A face looks into a face. The reflecting quality, since the idea of a mirror is in view. Now the so is a summary here. Line two, it ties the human heart to the reflection of water and the face. And that's clear from the word reflection in line two. So we've got these elements, all right? We've got water, reflecting face, we've got heart. So what's the proverb saying? Well, here's essentially what it's saying. That you can't tell a person's heart by looking at his face. Can't tell. That 
big toothy smile doesn't really tell you anything about what he is truly thinking on the inside. Here's the question. Is his heart with you? That's what we really want to know. Well, here is the insight from the proverb. Don't pay attention to the face. Watch the behavior. Don't pay attention to the words. Watch what he does. I think the classic illustration, in my mind, is the character Rick in Casablanca. Now, you all have seen Casablanca. I've seen it 50 times. I could, I could tell you what the dialogue is in Casablanca. But you look at Humphrey, Gobart, uh, Humphrey Bogart. You look at his stoic face. Rick, who is he? Is he a self-centered, hard-hearted? Is he a patriot? Is he a drunk? Who is Rick? You can't tell. You get these little shards and pieces in the story. He saves a, a young married girl's virtue at the roulette wheel, costing him money himself. And you think, oh, this is really a great guy. But then it's those letters of transit that is going to get him out of Casablanca. And he, he tells that seedy Signor Ferrari, you know, they're going to be for me. Me. That's not virtuous. And then he's got this relationship with Captain Renault. He's a con. And he has no character whatsoever. But it's at the end. It's at the end of the show. It's the last scene at the airport. That's where we find out everything about Rick. Really, his character comes in focus there. The way he treats Elsa and Victor Laszlo, her husband. It's the behavior. And that's what the proverb is saying. Pay attention to what somebody actually does. Not what they say. Here's 20. The grave in Abaddon. The proverb is about the impossibility of fulfilling desires. Notice the repetition in line 1 and line 2. Never satisfied. Now, if you've got a King James, you've got an image there in line two. It's a, it's a object that is half full, half full of whatever the content is. But the I, that is the image, but it is the same word. Never satisfied. Very important is the and at the beginning of line two, because see, that links up the pairs of line one the insatiable appetite of the grave to line two, the insatiable appetite of man or the human eye. Now, we open the proverb, the grave in Abaddon. Dark, foreboding place. We all get a one-way trip there. What is it? Well, we really don't have any idea by looking at a physical world that we live in. We have no idea. Job laments in his suffering. If a man dies, shall he live again? There's nothing in the physical world that tells us anything about death and beyond death. But what's clear that we do know and we do see is this voracious appetite of the grave. It never stops. It doesn't take time off. It strikes throughout 24 hours. In the middle of the night, early in the morning, in the middle of the afternoon. Doesn't even take holidays off. Never satisfied. There's always room for another and another and another. That's the point. And it never gets enough. And so, line two, in the same manner... That's why that and is so important. It links the two together. In the same manner, here is man. And he, 
His eye is never satisfied. Notice here the association with the eyes. The eyes are the figure for an appetite like the stomach that's never ultimately satisfied. A couple of weeks ago, I was walking out of the back of a hotel in Oklahoma City, and it was freezing. Arctic front, wind coming right out of the north, 25 miles an hour. I was dressed like the Michelin tire man, and you had to be, or you freeze to death. And I'm crunching across this parking lot, and I'm thinking, get in that car and get that heater on, and I'm going to be fine. And I open my car door, and suddenly I'm frozen. And I'm not frozen by the wind. I am frozen by what I see. There it is, 45 degree angle off my front bumper. I closed my car. I had never seen a car like this in my life. I walked around, and there it told me everything. Lamborghini. <laughs> I had never seen an SUV. I know you see them down here in Dallas all the time, but I'd never seen an SUV, Lamborghini. Man, I walked around it two times. I didn't care what the weather was now. And uh, I tried to look through the windows. I couldn't see. I got in the front, and there's that gold label, black hood. And for a moment, a tiny moment, yes, I could see myself behind that wheel. But then... I got back in my car, and I thought, how stupid are you? You can't even afford a wheel. <laughs> and then I comforted myself with the thought that as I'm driving back to my house, that what would I do with it? I certainly wouldn't take it to Dallas. Down here, Parking is such a premium, you get a thousand door dinks. I'm not going to let anybody within 25 yards of that car. That's the eye. It's the insatiable appetite of the eye. You see something new and it captivates you. It gives man full vent to his appetites. And that's what the proverb is saying. So, you look at what men do over the eye. The eye guides them. It drove King Ahab, 1 Kings 21, to tyranny. He killed righteous Naboth over his garden because he wanted it. The proverb is telling us never follow the eye. We follow the word. What did Jesus say repeatedly? Follow me. Don't follow your eye. Follow me. And then he puts it all in context when he tells us life does not consist in the abundance of the things that a man possesses. We think it does, but it doesn't. Life in reality is our one and only opportunity to really build a relationship with the living God. That's what life really is. A single devotion to Him to bring Him honor and glory. And what's remarkable is He's invisible. We can't see Him. But our eyes are filled with the cravings of the heart. The regenerated mind of Augustine summed it for us best. An eternal truth about us all. He writes, Thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless, Lord, until they find their rest in thee. And that's the truth. 
Here's 21, the crucible for silver, the furnace for gold, and a person is tested. Now, I'm going to work with your translation here. According to. It's according to. According to his praise. I'm going to show you that. Structurally, the first thing you look at in observing the proverb are the connection of the two ands. Line one and line two. If you have a King James, you have a so in line two. That's a summary. It's not a summary. If you have an NIV, you have a contrast. It says, but. It's not a contrast. No, it is the New King James translation, two ands. And that's the best translation, the clearest. So, what's the images? Well, you have the crucible, the test for purity in a metal, that's the, sur that's the furnace, small oven, smelting pot. The genuineness of gold is made pure and silver there. So the crucible is for silver, the furnace for gold, and that's the idea of the picture. Now, look, there's a testing mechanism in life, and it's the heart, it's praise. But let me show you this important connective in the proverb. It's not but, and, or so. It is according to, according to. Let me give you that text. It's Exodus chapter 12 and verse 4. Exodus 12, 4. It was the context of the Passover. And if you and your wife have no children, very small family, you have a lamb. And the provision was that you have more to eat than you and your wife can consume. So you take a portion of that lamb according to your neighbor who has ten children or seven. So I'm going to give you a portion of my lamb according to your need and your family. That's how it's used. And that's the proverb. It is testing according to praise. Now, what's the praise? Praise? Well... That's the tre tremendous temptation for self-boasting. Paul tells us Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. A man should not think more highly of himself than he should. 1 Samuel chapter 18 verse 7. The scriptures read, And the women came out from their places to meet King Saul, and they sang and danced with tambourines and other instruments and and they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Thus throwing both men by that one song into the crucible of the proverb. And from that one event, that day, one man is cursed and one man is blessed. David doesn't change. Doesn't affect him at all. Watch the behavior. It changes Saul. And that's what the proverb is saying. From that event. So I ask you, practically speaking regarding the proverb, can you honor others, pushing them forward, and not yourself? Can you get out of the limelight and find comfort in staying in the shadows yourself. That was George Whitfield, by the way. He did it for John Wesley. He kept pushing him forward. That's why everybody knew John Wesley. Never heard of George Whitfield, and no one heard of George Whitfield until the 1970s when George Dalimore wrote the two volume biography. And we thought, my goodness, where has this man been in church history? It's because he didn't want to be remembered. Does praise knock you off course? 
Or do you let it roll off you like water on a duck's back? See, the proverb is saying that praise tests the man. According to, it tests the man. And that's the proverb. 23, we now learn wisdom from the farm. Different venues here. Be sure to know the condition of your flocks. Um, pay, this is one simple exhortation. To know the condition of your flocks, pay attention to your herds. The parallel in the proverb is straightforward. Look, you know matches to be concerned, to pay attention to. Both words imply intensive involvement. Set your heart to, we would say. Be passionate about, we would say. That's the idea. I once hired a guy, young man, it was probably 20, over 20 years ago now, to take care of an athletic field. And uh, this guy came with unbelievable credentials, a sterling reputation. And we're walking this field. And uh, just looking at it, he's talking, I'm talking. And then I said to him, well, what do you think? Here was the line that got me. He said, Mr. Black, when people get up first thing in the morning, they open their eyes and they, they think about their day. Well, sir, I'm thinking Bermuda. Whoa, I've never forgotten that. That was 20 years ago. I hired him on the spot. Look, the farmer in ancient Israel, it takes a lot to provide for the farm. The collection of sheep and goats, herds, cattle. Now, look, it's not enough to turn it over to servants. No, this is the farmer himself. And those animals are his necessary equipment to run the farm. You don't turn that over to people. Back in the 60s and 70s, great coaches like Darrell Royal and Bear Bryant used to survey their practice field on towers 100 feet high. And that's because you had 150 players out on your fields. One, two, three, four fields. They don't do that anymore because of Title IX, women's sports. You don't have that kind of revenue. Now it's all shrunk down to 80, 85 players max. Where are the head coaches? Not up in the towers. No, they're down. They are touching. They are talking to. They are face-to-face -face with their players. Why? They're your assets. Real wisdom is vigilance with the assets that God has given you. So what's he given you? Be vigilant about it. Stay focused on what he has set before you. So what's he set before you? The land was a gift of God. Your talent, your skill, that's a gift of God. Good with numbers. Good with finance. Good with being able to read and understand material. That's a gift of God. And so, work at it. Become proficient in it. That's the idea. Now, we go to 24, to wisdom from the throne room. Not the farm. Here's the king's throne. And it's a warning. Wisdom moves from the farm to the throne. And here's what it is teaching us about the king. Look, crowns, wealth, symbols of the king, they're transitory. They don't last. They're perishable. Without wisdom, without righteousness, without fortitude, they go out the window. That's what the proverb is saying. 
you have to be diligent to preserve them and to recover them or you will lose your power and you will lose your kingdom. Did you hear what I said, Mr. Biden? Did you hear what I said, Mr. Schumer? This is your Hebrew Bible, sir. Did you hear it, Mr. McCarthy? You will lose your power. You know what makes a great nation? According to the Scriptures? Not a military. Not an economy. No. It's Proverbs 14.34. Righteousness. Righteousness. That's what makes a great nation. And God preserves the great nation. Look at this word forever. Term referencing just a lifetime of an individual. Here it is. Exodus 21.6. Here's the term being used. When a, a servant says, I don't want my freedom. I love my life with my master. Then he is granted his stay there. And it is a stay forever. That's our word. Meaning a lifetime. Your lifetime. My lifetime. Certainly not is the top line is an expression of an emphatic oath. So the king, his laws, his sayings, they can perish along with him. And they can go out the window in a lifetime. That's the point. That's generation to generation. Again, the length of life. All right, so let's frame it scripturally. We've heard Psalm 90. In the confines of this building, I bet I've heard that sermon and that psalm of Moses' wisdom psalm 20 times. Psalm 90, verse 10. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. Yet their span is toil and trouble. They are soon gone. What's soon gone? 70, 80 years. Goes. And Moses' conclusion, and we fly away. I'm not a big fan of ZZ Top, the Texas rock band trio. I think their lyrics are profane, and I have really nothing to do with them. But you may or may not know that one of their members, Dusty Hill, died a couple of years ago. His wife wrote these words. He woke me up, and we were talking, and we were just chatting along, when suddenly he stopped. He was gone in an instant, period. What does Moses say? Psalm 90, verse 10, Dusty Hill was 70 in his 70s. 70 years, 80 if our strength endures, and we fly away. There it is. You see, what you realize is everything's on a conveyor belt. It's all moving in front of you, passing before our eyes. I try to do something consciously for the kingdom every single day to honor Christ and to serve Him because He's my life. And so that's my goal. Time is the wealth that I have to invest in to make that happen. 70, 80 years, it goes by and it's gone. Don't squander your time. Invest it in what lasts. Now, 25, 26, 27. The proverb begins with a positive argument here. 
for taking care of one's flocks, herds, cattle. Uh, the opening word is a first class condition if or it could set the context of when. That could be your translation. It is the condition of the proverb. Grass being removed. You see that? That's to uncover. It disappears. But look what happens. New growth would spring up. New grass. New sprouts. After the rains have fallen upon the farmland in Israel. And this grass sprouts up. And there are these steep hills and mountainous territories all among the tribes of Israel. And they provide pasture land on the side of the hill, just as if you had removed the rocks and had the farm itself for the livestock. The picture here is the renewing power, God's power upon the earth. You remember that that picture, that incredible picture that we got of our astronauts standing on the moon, taking the picture back of our planet. And there it was, all blue and white. It was radiant. Sun shining down upon it. Now, take your telescope and go out and look at your solar system. I mean, we go crashing into Mars. We're passing Venus. Here we go, Saturn. And what do you see? You see nothing. It's a desolate waste. It's nothing. But we're so excited about it because we want to believe that there's life out here. Listen, let me help you here. God has told us that he has come here and his spirit hovered over the waters here. And he said, here, let there be life. And when we look at all these planets, and we look at all these orbits, what do we see? We see nothing like we see here. Because God was here. He spoke here. He sent his son here. Why don't people think sometimes? Line two. And the same condition of the top line here. Vegetation, fur to plants, wild growth in the wild. In ancient Israel, it was part of the farm. Mountains here mentioned. Yeah. Vegetation, it's natural growth. God springs it up. Because he said, let there be life. And it comes. This word together is a common Hebrew word for harvesting. What's the point? God in his providence and grace makes all the necessary provisions. Now, that's the way I talk to these young men. Because they've got Taxes, and they've got private schools, and, and they've got this, and they've got that. They, they have pressure put on them. I, I made my numbers in 22, but now I'm staring at bigger numbers in 23. How am I going to get by? What am I going to do? How should I think about this for the future? Well, here it is. Look, 26 and young rams. Look at that word, provide will be for, there it is, your clothing, your he goats, the price of a field. The emphasis is twofold here. First, line one, living in wisdom, walking in skill, the skill for living. God is going to give you tomorrow, right around the corner of your life, Renewable resources right out of the palm of your hand. He's provided them for. Look, young rams here. That one shepherds, they provide his clothing. The key to it all is to walk in wisdom. 
is not to be thinking about my multiplying my rams. No, you think about walking in wisdom. You think about serving the Lord. Lie passive in your hand, Lord. That means I am content to live and serve you. Lie passive in his hand and active in his service. I get up and I'm not thinking Bermuda. I get up and I'm thinking kingdom, Christ, Lord, opportunity today. What can I do for you today? Proverbs 4, don't forsake wisdom. She'll preserve you, says the father to the son. Love her. She will guard you, says the father to the son. So where will your clients come from tomorrow? Where will your deals be in the future? You want to know what the word of God says? It says don't give it one whit of worry. Don't. Why? Because manna comes from above. That's your daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. I've never seen a man plant manna. I've never seen him harvest manna. You don't water manna. You don't cultivate manna. We don't put manna in a greenhouse and grow it. It was there. And it came from above. That's your daily bread. It comes from above. Mr. Spurgeon, 160 years ago now, said these words that are as true as they are at this moment. He said, it is ours to obey. It is His to provide. Ours to obey, His to provide. You're not the author of your career. He is. And He has got a plan and purpose. Here's the second item from the proverb. Your name, your reputation is going to expand by the quality of what you produce that God has given you under His blessing. And what is it for the farmer? Well, here it is. It's he goats, the males of the flock. And they are made powerful and potent. And at the sale or at the trade, you expand your enterprise with how fastidious they are. Look, you're buying an additional field. You're expanding in real estate. And you see... God had a plan and a purpose to bring you out of darkness and into light. And that's why it's necessary for you to be proficient in what you do. Because you bring Him glory and honor. You build a name and a reputation. And that's the blessing of the Lord. He raised you up for a time such as this. And what are you doing? It builds up the family. Okay, what's the family? That's the kingdom for tomorrow. And it builds you up for today. And what is that? My opportunity to serve Him even greater. It's all about Him. Do I need to remind you before we close today that He's no man's debtor? He's not your debtor. The Lord God. The one who spoke the planets into existence. He's not your debtor. No. He's your provider. That's what he does. You think you are giving up something to serve him. You're going to get it back tenfold in every direction. Just serve him. Serve him. Here's the final one. Verse 27 You'll have enough goat's milk. The top line milk is really the comprehensive term for dairy, the indispensable source of nutrition in the ancient Near East. 
food to sustain you, and line two, all for the family. And secondly, see that? And it sustains you and it connects further benefits beyond the household, now the servants. The food in line one is the life in line three. Once again, it's the self-perpetuation that God brings when He blesses you. Your land was a gift. Your labor is what you do with your gifts for Him, and He will bless you and sustain you with them. And it's a tremendous blessing. You know, the most miserable people I've ever known in my life are people that are totally consumed with themselves. My money, my oil and gas interest, my properties, my, my, my. They're miserable. You want a, you want a case and study? Look at your billionaire, tech billionaires. You know, there's two things that are consistent about them all. The whole bunch. One, they're all atheists. Two, they're all divorced. They've given up the wife of their youth. No, they've traded her in. They've split the family. They've torn it asunder. All for what? God is teaching us something. Mammon will not provide what you think just won't. Isn't it interesting that it is wisdom that builds in the Scriptures? Wisdom. Except the Lord build the house, Psalm 127, 1. Except He build it. Those who labor, labor in vain. Wisdom builds. Wisdom builds up one another. Wisdom gives out to others. What does selfishness, self-centeredness do? It cuts asunder, it crushes, it breaks apart. That's your living lesson being characterized right before your very eyes today. Walk in wisdom. Walk in wisdom, you walk with the Lord. You walk with the Lord. You will live the greatest days of your life. If you don't know Jesus Christ personally as your Savior, don't leave this room without making that decision in your heart. Walk in wisdom by embracing Him. Dying to yourself and taking Him up and following. Follow me, He said. You're following a person. That's wisdom. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time of study today. How grateful we are to be around Your Word, in Your Word, through Your Word. It is our meat and drink. It is the source of life, the Word of God. Bless all who hear that Word in this venue Believer's Chapel today. In Jesus' name, amen.